this conference is full of now all these demos of machines that are connecting into brains and some of the talks uh, have been about connecting into brains. What, what are some of the um, things that you've seen shift in terms of tools and availability to understand the brain in the last 10 years? Well, of course, the biggest thing that has shifted is computers. And so we can an use the computers to analyze the incredibly complex signals that we get and measurements we get from you know, everything from microscopy to you know, arrays of very large numbers of, of probes and things like that. So um, we've got fantastic new tools like fMRI. So I think finally we're beginning to, to peek into it I think before, studying the brain was a little bit like studying sociology by dropping bombs on cities and you know, looking at how their output changed. <laughs> um, now, we've at least, we're at least throwing lightning bolts at <laughs> the people <laughs> or something like that. That's a, great, that's a great metaphor. I mean, before the invention of optogenetics, the way that they would perturb the brain is they would stick electrodes into the brain but that electrical signal is non-local and it would affect a whole region, just like dropping a bomb on a city. That's right, and of course a lot of our, a lot of our information about the brain came from brain injuries or surgeries or things like that, so it was really like taking out a whole neighborhood mm -hmm. and noticing a shift in function, and that was pretty much all we knew about the localization of function in the brain. I remember when I went to MIT, there was this paper called What a Frog's Eye Tells the Frog's Brain, where they had managed to probe individual neurons. They realized then for the first time that the neurons weren't just sending back pixels, they were actually sending back features like lines and dots moving across the field and so on. And so that was you know, the first time we started realizing, well, the neural processing actually starts in the retina. Amit Ekin showed us yesterday how he's using machine learning to analyze EEG data. And that's something that fell, EEG data fell out of favor for a while. It felt, they felt like it wasn't very useful, but now with the ability to, to crunch those huge bits of data coming off, we can actually make interesting. Well, this is a funny circularity because we're using tools that were inspired by neural, natural neural networks to build artificial neural networks, which are then used to understand natural neural networks. And so, for example, my work in parallel computing was in some loose sense inspired by the brain too. So at the time that I started making parallel computers, there was a mathematical proof that was widely believed that you couldn't make parallel computers. And I knew that something had to be wrong with that proof because the brain worked and the brain was made out of very slow components and yet it managed to do things like recognize a face very quickly. So I knew that maybe that was true in general, but it wasn't true about the computations required for intelligence. And so that's what caused me to make a computer that was more like the connectivity of the brain, which was the connection machine. You're continuing that trend um, of being cross-disciplinary. I know that you're working on a new project which is very computationally based, um, and yet you're here at the Brain Mind conference. Um, what are some of the ideas or influences that you're getting either from brain mind community or the, the larger world of neuroscience that are maybe informing uh, your work today? So I'm here at the conference because the brain is fundamentally the most interesting thing about us. It is us and it's the source of everything that's interesting about us. It, it's where pain gets generated, it's where pleasure gets generated, um, it's, it's where you know, imagination, ideas get generated, hopes get generated, everything about us that we care about happens in the brain. And it kind of is us in a sense that, well, if you took out any other organ in your body, you would still be you. That leads me to the question of how do you see consciousness? What's the definition of consciousness to you? My guess is consciousness is not actually going to turn out to be that important. That we probably have kind of a press agent inside that's trying to make a story of what's going on and explaining it. And so when I ask you, well, why did you do that? Your press agent makes up some story the same way, you know, the president's press agent makes up some story as to why the president did that. But, and you probably believe that you don't have any better story. It's like the like, work of Dan Ariely. People are very good at justifying 
after the fact why they did a certain thing. Yeah, that's right. So you have a commentator or someone who's sort of making the official history, but I don't think that that consciousness thing is the most important thing going on in our brain. I think it's the, it's the headlines. Mm -hmm. Is there a sense in which that justifying or that explaining is in itself a very human quality? David Deutsch talks about um, the ability to come up with explanatory knowledge. Yes, I think that explanation, that storytelling, if you will, when stories are about explanations in effect, um, is a uniquely human thing. And so I think a lot of our power comes from our ability to make up stories about things. But I don't think it's our only source of intelligence or power. So I, I sort of disagree with David Deutsch that that's all there is to intelligence. I think it's a powerful technique that we have for sort of getting a hold of the complexity of the world. But we have other techniques that uh, obviously we're doing something different when we, when we recognize a face or get uncomfortable in a situation for reasons we don't have a good explanation for. Or, you know, we're doing a different kind of processing. So I think the brain does lots of different kinds of processing. I mean, that's one of the things that I took away from my mentor, Marvin Minsky, is I really do believe the brain is almost like a society of different agents that work in different ways, sometimes it cross purposes to each other, and you know, what emerges is us. And consciousness is just the kind of the story being told about kind of an internal observer trying to make sense and mm -hmm. tell an oversimplified story of what's going on. Yeah, you go to a lot of different conferences, both uh, non-technical conferences and scientific conferences. Uh, what makes Brain Mind different for you? There's two reasons I come to Brain Mind. Uh, one is the subject, which is endlessly fascinating, and of course it's the biggest puzzle in science. And then the other one is the people, and I find a pretty interesting collection of my friends also show up here. 